On July 30th, 2016, Leo Santa Cruz, 32-0, 18 KOs, fighting his first undefeated and his prime opponent, 23-0, Carl Frampton. Cruz, who put on a great show, did not do enough to convince the judges he was the winner, losing to Frampton by majority decision. Cruz will go on to avenging his loss in early 2017. Ricky Hatton, 43-0, 31 knockouts. Hatton was the first fighter to be part of Mayweather's prize fight sweepstakes, or you may call it the Mayweather sweepstakes. And you know, this fight tonight, what round was it? Round four. I think you saw more action in these four rounds than you saw the value for money in Floyd's whole career. I'll just leave it at that. When, when Hatton made the comment that he made on HBO, Floyd looked to me and said, make the fight happen. Hatton started the fight well. But due to being unable to fight his fight on the inside, Joe Cortez, who was awfully quick breaking up the two upon contact, this gave Mayweather the space he needed to wear Hatton down to where he was easily able to take him out in the tough round. At 34-0, 29 knockouts, Jones was undisputedly pound for pound the best fighter in boxing. This was Roy's second fight at light heavyweight, and it was for the WBC light heavyweight championship against Montel Griffin. The fight started out slow for Roy, as he was having trouble honing in on the slick Griffin, whom in his last fight beat James Tony. The tide changed going into the back half of the fight as Griffin was starting to slow down. In the ninth round, Roy finally cracked him, and Griffin took a knee. Roy accidentally hits Griffin as he was down. Griffin, knowing he'll probably lose if the fight continues, milks this moment to convince the referee and the commission to rule this fight a disqualification, giving Jones his first loss. Roy will go on to avenging that loss, knocking Griffin out in the first round. The amount of hype on Adrian Broner was absolutely insane. He was seen as the next Floyd Mayweather before he even gathered the credentials to even be in talks of being compared to Floyd. 33-0, 24 knockouts, Adrian Broner makes his first title defense of his welterweight WBA belt against 34, 3, and 31 knockouts, Marcos Maidana. This was a fight Broner should have never taken, but it's the risk you gotta take to be great. As Broner makes his way back to the dressing room, losing for the first time. In 2010, Sergio Martinez beats Kelly Pavlik for the WBO, WBC, and Lineal Middleweight Championship. New middleweight champion of the world, Just a couple months later, Martinez was wrongfully stripped of the WBO title. And this leads to Daniel Jacobs, 20-0, 17 KOs, was put up against relatively unknown 16-0, 13 KOs, Dimitri Pyrock. From the start of the bell, the 23-year-old Jacobs showed his age, and Pyrock on that night was on a whole different level, putting on a show to knock Jacobs out in the fifth round. Going by these grossly scored scorecards, all judges had Jacobs ahead, and by the expression of the WBO president's face upon the knockout, this was obviously not part of the script. In 2001, Zab Judah was on top of the world at 27-0, 21 knockouts, carrying the IBF title. He was fighting the 27-1 WBA and WBC unified champion, Costa Zoo. This fight was for the undisputed junior welterweight championship. After an incredibly easy first round for Judah, no one imagined 
the events that would happen in the second round. I go to the corner, I'm like, yo, got this dude, yo. And by like, no, keep your hands up, stay focused, handle your business first. And I'm like, yeah, all right, whatever. I go out there, drop my hands, start backing up, looking pretty, just kind of styling on him, looking, you know what I'm saying? I go backwards, and he caught me, bop. Floors Judah, he's up very quickly, but his eyes are in orbit. It's over. Jane Aidy stopped it, and Costin Sue has unified the light welterweight division for the first time in 33 years. America and Western countries were finally paying attention to the lower weight classes. After such a long time, thanks to Roman Gonzalez. But this is quite a sad story, because as Roman was finally getting the worldwide recognition he deserves, he came into the mainstream just as he was about to leave his prime. Fighters in the lower weight classes tend to age progressively faster than fighters in the higher weight classes. Forty-six and zero and thirty-eight knockouts. Roman Gonzalez is fighting forty-two and four, thirty-nine knockouts. Sirsikit sore rung the side. I have to blame HBO and some boxing media for not properly informing who Rung Visai was and what kind of fighter he is. This was a 50-50 fight when it came to who was going to win. Before the uneducated boxing fan, they only see what's on paper, which made people think Rung Visai was not a good fighter as a fair share of his opponents do not have a good record. But boxing in Thailand is far different from boxing in America or Western countries. The average Thai fighters are much more active yearly than the average Western fighter. Taking that into account, and also the fight fans did not bother to watch Rungvi Sai's fight, especially the one against Carlos Quadras, an opponent Roman had struggled to beat. Rungvi Sai, whom was the champ at the time, was starting to find his mark late, and even hurt Quadras. <laughs> Unfortunately, the fight was stopped on cuts and Quadras escaped with a technical decision. Rungvisai led a campaign to get another shot and regain his title after his loss to Quadras in 2014. In 2015, he became the WBC Silver Champion and the number one ranked WBC fighter at Super Flyweight, making him Quadras' mandatory. When you have both titles being number one and having a silver title, it's crazy how Rungvisai was avoided and pretty much screwed over by the WBC. Not having the money, like these guys, to wait around to get their shot, Rungvisai stayed busy, fighting anyone and remaining sharp as possible. In 2015, he fought six times. In 2016, he fought five times. His last fight being in December of 2016. Rungvisai finally got his shot to fight for the title once again. For the average, idiot, paint chip eating fight fan, they thought Gonzalez was cherry picking. Little they knew, this man was the most ferocious and avoided fighter in the division. Quadras even stating the week of the fight, Rungvisai is no pushover and he hits very hard. Once again, the sheep fans did not listen. I told everyone that would listen, Roman may lose his fight. But knowing me, and how I talk a lot about Asian fighters, I get the usual, you need to stop hyping up these Asian bombs. On March 18th, Rangvisai momentarily shut everyone up being Roman Gonzalez. The boxing media call it an upset, but I'm not going to call it an upset at all due to me knowing this guy was good, thanks to doing actual research. For the rest of the cheap fight fans that screamed out robbery, they were later put to silence as Rungvisai did the unthinkable of knocking Gonzalez out in a brutal fashion. A fighter that the fight fans 
and the media failed to do some simple research on a fighter who was labeled a cherry. That man today is the lineal and WBC champion and is ranked number eight pound for pound. Let's get started. When boxers lose their O, part two. Starting the list is boxing great Bernard Hopkins. Hopkins actually lost his first pro bout to Clinton Mitchell by majority decision. Due to his age, when he picked up boxing, and that one blemish on his record, many slept on Hopkins as a world-class fighter. He used the negativity as a positive and paved a path to a Hall of Fame career and made many smart boxing fans rich betting on his fights where he was somehow the underdog in. Oh boy, Conor McGregor. His first pro bout as a boxer fights Floyd Mayweather and is absolutely taken to school. If you have Mayweather stalking you down, like Pretty Boy Floyd from the 90s and early 2000s, that's already a problem for you. Now McGregor claimed he had a good amateur boxing background. Looking at the fight, it's hard to believe that when he's trying to hammer fist his opponent. These claims hold as much weight as Frank Dukes's ninjutsu background. By the end of 2007, Juan Diaz was a fucking man, unifying the division against Brazilian lightweight great Asselino Freitas and Julio Diaz to top off 2007. Juan's first fight to start the 2008 year was against Nate Campbell. Campbell was a highly underrated lightweight who people didn't really even give a chance of winning. Due to very unfortunate shortcomings in a title run, it really set him back to where he was in complete ruin. After that fight, I looked at him, you know, some guys were mad at him, some were like kind of walking away, and I, and I said, Nate, let me tell you something. I said, man, listen, whatever you do, believe in yourself. I said, because I believe in you. I said, I won't leave you. I said, I love you. I said, I will not leave you. <laughs> Damn. <I'm just> gonna... <sighs> He's just special. People just thought that Diaz was just going to do what Diaz does best and outwork and outpunch Nate into submission. Nate at 36 years old and Juan Diaz at 24 years old. Not many gave him a chance. But no more so than even just winning the rails is the fact that it looked like he's on the verge of winning the fight by knockout. It appears we are watching Nate Campbell as he finally capitalizes on an opportunity for which he has waited so long. And Juan Diaz's 33 and no record is sinking into oblivion. Nate Campbell! In the 90s, Tool was being hyped up as the next Mike Tyson. In 1997, he would meet his match against heavyweight boxing's most underrated contender, 16-0 Ike Ibebuchi, and a fight of year candidate. A total of 1,730 punches were thrown, and Ike set the Kapu Box record as the most punches thrown by a heavyweight. Ike would go on to win by a very close unanimous decision, giving Tua his first loss. An explosive left hook by Tua, and Tua again, and again. Upset City for the second consecutive week on Boxing After Dark. A giant upset strikes the heavyweight division. Paul Williams was one of the most feared fighters of the past two decades in the welterweight division. With the height of six foot one, the arm length of 79, and was a volume puncher who easily could throw 800 to 1,000 punches a fight, top fighters avoided Williams like the plague. In February 2008, Williams was set up against the six to one underdog, Carlos Quintana. Quintana was not a bad fighter at all. He was real slick, hard to punch guy that would give a certain type of fighter a lot of trouble due to his awkward style. Reasons why people slept on Carlos, besides Williams being a monster, was because his first loss against Miguel Cotto a year and a half prior to this fight, he was brutally beaten by Cotto. The corner urged him to continue the fight, but Carlos did not want to continue. 
After this fight, many people on the web questioned his heart and gave him immature nicknames such as Quitana. Coming to this fight, he really had a chip on his shoulder and wanted to prove that he does have heart and he will do whatever it took to beat the boogeyman at welterweight. And on this night, he did, beating Paul Williams by unanimous decision. What led to Williams' first loss this fight, he did a lot of overthinking and waiting around. By the time he decided to make his move, Quintana already made his and was scoring point after point, raking in rounds. Williams in the rematch will see past his smoke and mirrors and make easy work of Quintana. Two minutes, 15 seconds into the first round. Tito was the biggest name in boxing and was on top of many pound for pound lists. The man in his way to end the middleweight championship series was the 36 year old Bernard Hopkins, whom people completely slept on. Though it was an incredibly entertaining fight, especially at the 10th round, that round being voted as Ring Magazine round of the year of 2001, Hopkins flat out gave Trinidad a boxing lesson. For supporters of Trinidad, it was one of the most saddest sights to see. During this generation of the heavyweight division, where fighters from all ex-Soviet countries held all the belts, and not one single American cared about what was happening in this division. All four heavyweight title belts belong to fighters born and raised in former Soviet republics. So if the heavyweight division is dying in America, it is alive and well in Eastern Europe. Valuev silently made a rose up to an astonishing record of 46-0. The man to beat him was Ruslan Chagaev by a pencil-thin majority decision. Rocky Marciano's record was at 49-0. Most guys, once they reach 45, it gets really hard. So close, but yet so far at the same time. Especially when you're fighting the best in boxing. Tony came into the fight with Roy Jones Jr. as a favorite to win at 6-5. It was ranked number two pound for pound and the record of 44-0 against some of the most notable world-class fighters of that era. According to paper and the betting odds, Tony was supposed to win this fight. Whomever set that up was so wrong. Jones completely white Tony, which was absolutely insane at the time. Forrest had a big year defeating undefeated Shane Mosley, not once, but twice. His first fight to start the new year of 2003 was a lineal title unification against the little known WBA champion Ricardo Mayorga. Forrest came into a rude awakening and caught some unsuspected heat being stopped in the third round. And that time he was seriously hurt. Yeah, look at the wobbling in Vernon Forrest. Marty Dickens stops the fight! Forrest performed better in the rematch, but still came up short in the scorecards, losing back to back against Mayorga. December of 98, Vladimir Klitschko faces pretty much the Darnell Boone of the heavyweight division at the time. The always dangerous Ross Purity. Vladimir had never fought on past the eighth round, though he had three 12 round scheduled fights only to go less than five rounds. Ross took the inexperienced Vladimir into deep waters. Once he had Vlad right where he wanted to, he took him out in the 11th round. Way up on the scorecards, Vitaly encountered a torn rotator cuff, which forced him 
to retire from the fight. Larry Merchant, obviously not knowing the situation, stated he doesn't have the mentality of a champion. I can hardly believe what I just saw. I can't believe what I just saw. Like how Vitaly avenged Lad's loss, Vladimir did the same for his brother, brutally beating Bird for seven rounds before being stopped. Lewis was the WBC heavyweight champion, facing the five and a half to one underdog, Oliver McCall. With the great mind of Emmanuel Stewart in the corner of McCall, they had the perfect game plan of beating Lewis, which they certainly did, knocking Lewis out in the second round. Lewis unbeaten, remember, after 25 fights. Oh, he's got him. Oh, Lewis walked into a right hand, and that was the sucker punch that they worried about. And Lewis staggers, and the referee has uh, decided it's all over. My goodness, what an upset. And Lennox Lewis's career must now be... Lewis fired his trainer immediately following the fight and teamed up with Stewart. Lewis will go on to avenge his loss against Bacall, which he will win the fight under the most unusual circumstances. Oliver McCall is now crying. Let's listen in. I mean, we, these people didn't pay to see an execution, you know? This something's not right. That's it. That it is. is it. The fight is over. Mills Lane. Kelly was seen as the best featherweight in boxing at an unprecedented record of 41-0. That would change the start of 1995 against number six ranked Alejandro Gonzalez. Kelly was getting outworked and outshined by Gonzalez. He was really trying his best to win the fight, digging deep and putting down Gonzalez in the eighth round. But unfortunately, it was not enough, and Kelly's corner stopped the fight in fear of causing future damages, as Kelly was pretty much blind in both eyes due to the swelling. Look at me. Look at me. Let me see you look at me. Fight's over. Fight's over. Whoa, Kevin. Fight's over. I don't want to go away. I want to go. Fight's over. Fight's over. I don't. There it is. To start this list off, Amir Khan came into the fight with 18 wins, 14 by KO. The amount of hype on Khan was pretty high despite his defensive flaws, obnoxiously showing in his last couple of matches prior to this. Khan's opponent, Bradis Prescott, was undefeated, 19 wins, 17 by knockout. This fight was a huge step up and risk for the green Amir because of Bradis' size and punching power. Khan may have taken Prescott lightly due to all of his fights that were by KO were in South America and his one and only fight outside of South America was a close split decision victory against Richard Abril. From the opening bell, Khan got struck with heat that completely caught him off guard. Prescott put him away 54 seconds of the first round. Camacho, with the record of 30-0, was making his third defense of his WBO junior welterweight title. Camacho had quite a bit of trouble trying to make weight. Desperate measures were taken, and he spent seven hours exercising and waiting around in a sauna to make the junior welterweight limit. Incredibly close fight, with a knockdown in round three scored by Camacho. The fight was still up for grabs in round 12. Camacho came in to touch gloves with Hagen. Hagen refused to touch gloves. The ref, Carlos Padilla, urged Hagen to touch gloves, and Hagen continued to remain disobedient. That made Camacho throw a jab and a lead at Hagen, which Carlos split the two up immediately to take a point off of Camacho. Hagen celebrates as he knows that probably won him the fight, and it did due to the point deduction that overturned what would have been a draw. So pretty much Hagen won the fight just doing what Hagen does best, being an unsportsmanlike asshole. Hagen tested positive 
after the fight for marijuana, the Nevada Commission fined him $25,000 and ordered him to attend drug counseling. Now, as I was saying, uh, drugs are bad. You shouldn't do drugs. Uh, if you do them, you're bad. Griffin came into the rematch 27-0, despite being on his way to losing against Roy Jones. If it wasn't for Jones accidentally hitting Griffin while he was on his way down taking a knee. Jones fueled by absolute anger, mainly due to Griffin parading around like he was going to win all along and it was far from a fluke. Do you want a rematch? He probably won't fight me no more, man. The kind of heat I put on it? Yeah, come on. I mean, I'll take a rematch at a heartbeat, but he probably won't want to fight me no more, you know? I was making a miss. He caught me with a couple of shots during the fight, but it wasn't nothing hard. His face was all swollen up, and uh, I thought it was winning, feeling it fair square. Will you give Roy Jones a rematch? We'll see. We'll see. We'll sit down. I, I, I'm in a position right now to tell you. I want Virgil Hill, but we'll sit down and talk about it. Well, I think it's going to be a matter of money, and Griffin is going to demand the large amount of money. If they can satisfy Griffin, he'll give him a rematch. Jones came out guns blazing, dropping him fairly early in the first round. Jones settled down a bit and measured Griffin, and at the 2 minute 31 second mark, Jones launches a shot that will forever be remembered by boxing fans of his career, completely flattening Griffin. Despite Griffin getting two more title shots down the road, he wasn't fully able to come back into the light heavyweight picture. His tricky style was finally cracked. Dawson was coming off a decent 2008 and great 2009 year with an impressive record of 29-0. Dawson was ranked number one by Ring Magazine and Pascal was number two. Pretty much Dawson's demise in this fight was a complete lack of a killer instinct. Pascal was mainly winning based on his sheer aggression and landing punches and bunches. Mainly the rounds Dawson won was rounds where Pascal was completely gassed out and Dawson was able to land but not fall up to make any difference in the fight entirely. And in the 11th round, Dawson lands a picture-perfect upper cut and stops Pascal in his tracks, Dawson completely misses the opportunity, doesn't follow through, and plays a conservative when he's way down in the scorecards. The fight was later stopped on cuts, and Pascal was awarded the Ring Magazine title. Foreman was seen as the boogeyman, with a record of 40 wins and 37 by knockout. Foreman blew away the man that beat Ali, Joe Frazier, in the second round, then blew through Ken Norton, whom beat Ali as well, but lost to Ali in the rematch by a close decision. Foreman was a giant favorite to beat Ali. How many fellas in here now picks joys? Be truthful, be me. He tells you, John, raise your hand. <laughs> but Ali had a trick up his sleeve. Uh, very heavy hitters who were sort of clumsy, he let them bang away at him. It was as if he wanted to train his body to receive these messages of punishment and absorb them faster than other fighters could absorb them. Ali allowed Foreman to completely punch himself out while he was on the ropes. Occasionally, Ali would pepper him with some shots here and there. And Foreman's insane with rage and wanging at him and wanging at him and wanging at him. Powerful, powerful, powerful. And in the middle of the fifth round, Foreman was worn out. He had punched himself out. Taking three rounds. By the eighth round, Foreman was completely exhausted. Ali, who was well prepared and fresh, was able to catch him with a beautiful combination that would stagger Foreman, ultimately putting him down. 28 and 0, Tommy Morrison was against his first real test at heavyweight after fighting former 80s Mike Tyson opponents. 17 and 0, Ray Mercer was making his first real defense of his WBO belt. At first, it looked like Morrison was on his way to victory till he started to tire out in the fourth. In the fifth round, a fatigued Morrison made a vital mistake of clinching Mercer at an odd angle to where he missed the clinch and Mercer was able to land a freebie shot which followed up with a barrage of shots after Mercer saw that he hurt Morrison, resulting in his first loss. With an added note, I like how they tried to spin it and not give Mercer the credit he deserved. The commentator claimed this was too big of a step up for Morrison, whom already had 28 fights on his resume. 
Obviously, this was too big a step for Morrison right now. Post and Mercer, who only had 17 and had picked up boxing at the age of 23 in the military. But yes, keep in mind, Mercer was able to knock out every opponent to win a gold at the Seoul Olympics. But as we have seen through boxing history, having a medal doesn't guarantee your all-around success at the professional level in the sport. I've always thought Ray Mercer would have a better chin. It would tough, be tough for Morrison to hurt him. I'm just not sure Ray Mercer's ready for this fight. And, 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 and at this moment, I've never done this in my life before. I just changed my mind. I think maybe Morrison will win. This is actually a pretty interesting story here and my personal favorite on the list. Butterbean was being brought up through the boxing hype machine thanks to his story as the unbeatable strongman, which I could see that, and his unbelievable punching power, which was shown in his earlier fights against guys who looked like they were scouted by matchmakers at some random trucker bar in a one-horse state like Montana. Butterbean's record was at a questionable 15-0, so his opponent here particularly had an incredibly misleading record of one in six with one KO. Now these matchmakers just set Butterbean up with Mitchell Rose just based off his record. Little they knew, Rose was a New York State Golden Gloves champion. This guy was a good boxer. Who knows how he got in the predicament where he had a record like that. So this guy had some skills and what I assume is after when these amateur matchmakers found out which was a couple days before the fight, Rose was reportedly offered $5,000 to take a dive from Butterbean's handlers. Now let's get real here, Mitch is from Brooklyn. This fight is at Madison Square Garden, a hop, skip, and a jump away from Brooklyn. And this fight is live on HBO. He ain't gonna allow some dude with no real boxing experience clown him in front of his fellow New Yorkers and Brooklynites. Too much pride is on the line here. Unlike Broner, this was a real I did it for the hood moment. From the starting bell, it was evidently clear that Mitch was better fundamentally than Butterbean. The Golden Glove champ, Mitch Rose, came out that night. And in the second round, he stops Butterbean. Whoever put money down on Mitch, I applaud you, and I wouldn't be surprised if Mitch put money on himself too. Now Mitch is quite of a character. He made a music video called The Man Beat Butterbean, sued Jay-Z for 88 million, and Mike Tyson for 66 million. And crazy enough, this actually did happen. He sued both. The former heavyweight champ lost his infamous temper and tried to knock him out, hitting him in the neck, shredding his mink coat to pieces when Rose fell to the ground, injuring his hip and back. And I'm standing there looking at this guy like, you know, he's actually ripping my mink coat up. Sixty-six million dollars? What, what are you claiming here? Well, the lawsuit has three components to it. First, a claim for the injury to his body. Mm -hmm. Secondly, property damage. His coat was torn up ferociously by Mike Tyson. Very interesting boxer. Go check out his music video. I enjoyed watching it. It's not really too much to say here. A very young 16-0 Sergio Martinez. He really wasn't ready for this fight. He was way too green. That was his last legitimate loss till the first Paul Williams fight nine years later. And some people think that Martinez won the first fight. And, you know, I think he won too. So, you know, you could say his first loss was, uh, since the Margarito fight was against Goto. Darius Mikulszewski was one of the last fighters for a while to actually get close to Rocky's clean 49-0 record. This was Darius's 23rd consecutive title defense, and it was for the lineal and WBO light heavyweight title. Two historic moments were on the line here. A Darius win, he would be the first boxer to tie Rocky's record. Now, in order to be eligible for this record, you need to be a world champion, obviously need to have a completely clean record, so no draws or no, no contests. The second historic moment, with a Gonzalez win, he will be Mexico's first light heavyweight champion. Gonzalez did the unimaginable of coming back in the middle rounds and doing enough to win a close split decision in Germany, in which that is incredibly hard to do. Germany is one of the hardest places to win a decision and receive fair officiating. Julio Gonzalez as Mexico! Joshua coming into the fight with a well-decorated 22-0 record 
and was a heavy favorite against Andy Ruiz. Me, personally, I didn't know why Joshua was a heavy favorite. Ruiz had an actual chance to beat Joshua, and I based it off of Joshua's last performance against Povetkin. I didn't like his training methods, and certainly didn't like how he looked in the fight. He got too bulky and was training to look pretty, rather train like you would expect out of a world-class heavyweight boxer. Ruiz, who looked exponentially slimmer at the weigh-in, I knew at that point this was going to be a tough fight. People slept on Ruiz because of his build. He's just naturally a big guy. He he's not going to get shredded. For a guy Ruiz's size, he has incredibly fast hands, and that caught Joshua off guard. What helped most, which led to the complete turnaround in the fight, Joshua did not use his range and tried fighting Ruiz close up. Big mistake. Ruiz's shots came in quicker than Joshua's and he was able to land and really put the beat down. Ultimately, where Joshua, with all that muscle, was completely exhausted and was too tired to continue, ruining Joshua's American debut. On a personal note here, I do like both guys, but I really have to give Ruiz props here. Due to these stupid, politically divided lines, it's a rare occasion from someone from PBC to cross these lines and fight another fighter from a different network, also vice versa. Due to the Miller fight being cancelled, and Ruiz, who was ranked by the WBO just before he got let off by top rank, it was just a rare opportunity for Ruiz to take, and he trained his ass off for that fight. He was already training before the Miller-Joshua fight was off. After finally rinsing out that bad taste from Ariel Klitschko, watching a guy who completely threw away an opportunity to make history, I lost hope completely that I probably won't see a Mexican heavyweight champion anytime soon. Sometimes I don't think he gives us the best chance to win, being sometimes that he comes in a little out of shape, you know, a little bit too far out of shape. At times it is, it is very frustrating. Michael Phelps smoking weed, why can't I drink a beer? You know, that guy's still setting records. Why can't I have a beer? He had gotten up to about 290, which is by far the heaviest he had ever gotten. It's a problem, but at the same time, it's not. Because, shit, I work hard. I'm going to play hard. Especially after Parker Ruiz. Mad props to Ruiz for taking full advantage of this golden opportunity to make history. With that being said, the rematch is this week, guys. Will Ruiz prove to the majority of boxing fans and the casuals that this fight was not a fluke? Will Joshua get his revenge? You'll find out on the next episode of Joshua Ruiz. Someone's O must go in this fight. This fight was to decide who was the best fighter in the UK at the middleweight division. This was for the European, British, and Commonwealth title. The winner goes on to fight for the world title. This is what I like about other countries and their fight fans taking these national and regional title fights seriously, unlike in America. As I was mentioning in my Japanese fighter video, winning the Japan national title and the OPBF title, which signifies you are the best fighter in the Asian and Pacific region, is a big deal. The fight fans from both Europe and Asia really gather and rally behind that. But in America, it seems like no one really cares. Oh, NABF, NABO title. Oh, you are the NABF, NABO champion? Okay, whatever. That's pretty much the mindset Americans view of these belts, despite it signifying you are the best fighter in North America and will maybe catch a shot at the world title. And it's due to that lack of care that when these guys do get a title shot, they are seen as a nobody. It's sad how much those belts have devalued over the years. But anyways, back on track. Saunders made a bold statement, if he loses, he retires, and from the opening bell, he racked up an early lead. Though Eubank had his moments, and really came on late, it was not enough as Saunders came away with the split decision victory. Yeah, Saunders not quite where he was, oh it's a good shot, oh, lovely, lovely right up, lovely. that is quality boxing from Saunders. And still, the British, European, and Commonwealth middleweight champion. The lineal featherweight champion, 62-0 Willie Pep, was against 69-17. and 17. The former undisputed lightweight champion, Sammy Angat. Despite Pep being a 3-1 favorite to win, the reason why he was the favorite besides being a master boxer, this was Sammy's first fight back after retiring briefly as the undisputed champion to heal up after being injured, which five months to today's standards is not much of a retirement. 
It was pretty much a competitive back and forth battle, but Sammy getting the better of Pep, winning the first four out of five rounds. Pep will rally back, evening up the score, and when it was starting to go into Pep's favor during the ninth round, the heavier Angad hurt Pep and really put a beat down on him. And Pep wasn't surely able to recover, losing both the ninth and tenth. Since this was a non-title fight, Pep's title was not on the line, but it was a 10 round fight, and due to his collapse in round 9 and 10, Sammy escaped away on the scorecards by a narrow unanimous decision victory. The blueprint to beat Berto was pretty much out the box, a year and some change prior to this fight, when Berto faced Luis Colazzo. Many believe Colazzo won that fight. If Ortiz used that very same blueprint, he could have a chance of beating Berto despite coming into the fight as a 3-1 underdog. This fight was for the WBC welterweight title. The winner fights Floyd Mayweather Jr. later that year. Mayweather, who was a WBC champion emeritus because he retired as a champion back in 2007 after the Ricky Hatton fight, he had first dibs at the title when he felt ready. Ortiz who came into the fight really with a chip on his shoulder, really wanted to prove to the fans that he had heart after that fiasco in the past with the Madonna fight. We'll see what happens from here on out, man. Um, I'm young, but I don't think I deserve to be, you know, getting beat up like this. So I have a lot of thinking to do. Ortiz started the fight quick, dropping Berto in the first round. In the second round, Berto still seemed shaken up, and Ortiz was able to pound away till towards the end of the round, Berto was able to tie up the knockdown count and catch Ortiz. After the second round, Ortiz, who came in the fight much heavier than Berto, was able to power straight through Berto, outlanding and just shaking him up. Berto was taking such a beating that in round six, the doctor wanted to take an extra look at him to see if everything was okay before resuming the fight. Berto, now desperate, was able to drop Ortiz, and this time really hurt him. Ortiz gets back up and was in complete survival mode. The ref was very close to stopping the fight. I remember watching this fight live and I was like, yeah, he, he's, he's about to jump in and stop. It. As he was just about to make his move, Ortiz lands one good shot. Ortega, the referee, hesitated. Then Ortiz lands again, this time dropping Berto, saving himself from being stopped. That final knockdown really put a number on Berto and he really wasn't able to get his legs back into the fight. And Ortiz swept through the scorecards, winning by a unanimous decision. 47-0 Gene Tunney was fighting 194-11 Harry Greb. This was Tunney's first defense of the American light heavyweight title. Greb was a 3-1 betting favorite. This was an incredibly bloody fight. Tunney was cut on both eyes, bleeding from the nose and inside the mouth. He reportedly lost two quarts of blood. After all of that, Tunney was able to last all 15 rounds to lose by a wide unanimous decision victory. Greb had completely outclassed them. Apparently, some crazy old rich man burned all of Greb's fight films. So it looks like we'll never be able to see this fight. But personally, I think there's some copies that exist, and some old, very rich collector of historic memorabilia is hoarding his film reels. I wouldn't be surprised. These types of people just buy up priceless forgotten pieces of history and just hoard it. Which is also another problem with the preservation of boxing history. A lot of these old fights from the early 1900s shot on film need a 4K digital rescan. Boxing, unfortunately, the only sport where footage is hard to view in its original form. With the UFC, you can go through their entire archive and view it in the highest quality. It's sad that with boxing, you have to rely on some guy who recorded the fight on VHS or digitally ripped it from his DVR. And if you don't have the original file, it looks like complete trash. There needs to be a historic database for boxing fights that is open for public viewing. Pagara was really being hyped up as the next star from the Philippines to break through in the States. 
He was currently ranked number 6 in the world by Ring Magazine at Super Bantamweight. This fight was for the WBO Intercontinental title. The winner goes on to fight for the WBO Interim title against Isaac Dagobe. Pagara starts off the fight well, knocking down Juarez in the first round. Juarez was able to really get inside and pressure Pagara, but Pagara was able to get the best of Juarez, but not for long. He was showing serious signs of fatigue. Going to the 8th round, he was up on two of the judges' scorecards and literally at the beginning of the eighth, Juarez launched a massive three-punch combination, flooring Pagara. This was Vasil Lomachenko's second professional fight. It was for the vacant WBO featherweight title. A win here would have been the record breaker, which that was currently held by Sansek Mungsurin of Thailand, who became the WBC junior welterweight champion in three professional bouts in 1975. Orlando Salido was a champion, but he didn't make weight. He was two pounds above the featherweight limit and didn't even attempt to drop the rest. So therefore, the title was vacant only for Vasil if he were to win. Salido came into fight day weighing 147 pounds, while Lomachenko came in at 136. Fight in Texas? Check. Lawrence Cole is referee? Check. Salido a 4.7 to 1 underdog? Check. I don't even have to name off anymore. Looks like we got ourselves some controversy brewing. So the weight advantage was evidently clear and Salido took full advantage of that and then some. Salido got away with a lot of dirty tactics and Lawrence Cole was just being Lawrence Cole we all are accustomed to seeing. I mean, I was pretty mad myself about the, how bad the officiating was, but I couldn't help to laugh at HBO's commentary. Salido was able to escape away with a split decision victory. Oh my god. Oh my god. What in the world is Cole doing? <laughs> he buys Salido some time. That's what it looks like. <laughs> Unreal. A spirited performance by Salido. Yes, by A terrific attempt at a comeback by Lomachenko and a dreadful refereeing job from Lawrence Cole. <laughs> Everything we might have expected to see and more. <laughs> wow, this is the second undefeated opponent with a crazy record that Harry Greb defeated. This was actually their third fight. The fight was outside and according to the records, it was a back and forth battle. Then going into the seventh round, it poured down raining and continued till the end of the fight. The last four rounds were something from a Hollywood movie, but too bad footage was destroyed by some crazy old man. Or aliens. Who knows. Greb won by a newspaper decision. Yeah, uh, newspaper decision. Ever heard about it? It's a decision rendered by sports writers after a fight had ended inconclusively. Asselino Freitas will go on in history as one of the greatest or the greatest champion to hail from Brazil. Freitas fought very well early, but the second half of the fight, Corrales was still incredibly fresh and Freitas was spent. After the seventh round, Freitas would be dropped in the eighth and the ninth. Then finally in the tenth round, after being dropped again, Freitas felt like he took too much punishment and felt like it was the right time to retire from the fight. This was the ninth title defense by Barrera. Stylistically, Jones just had Marco's number. And in the fifth round, Jones floors Barrera. Jones goes in to finish Marco in the final seconds to end the round off. And this is when the fight ends weird. The bell rings, Jones still wailing on Barrera. The ref never heard the bell go off. So that forced the corner to run out, get the ref to stop the fight. Despite the bell already ringing off, which by rules, the corner can enter the ring, the fight was still ruled a disqualification victory for Jones. Coming into 2002, Morales was in his second weight class of featherweight and was currently the WBC champion. His second defense of that title was against 54-3 Marco Antonio Barrera in a long-awaited rematch. Their first fight was a unification bout in the Super Bantamweight division back in 2000. I'm guessing Barrera didn't want to pay sanctioning fees and he did not accept the WBC title, but this was for the vacant Ring Magazine and Lineal title. This was a Tijuana versus Mexico City fight, which it's a rivalry itself. The fight did not disappoint. 
all-out action. Well, this time around, Barrero was able to do more and was able to edge Morales on a close unanimous decision win. Depending on what you were looking at, specifically in the fight between the two, may judge who won. Harold chose Morales winning on the scorecards, 115-113. And two of the official judges scored the same, but in Barrera's favor. Casides really caught the attention of many Americans and HBO themselves who were trying to find the next Arturo Gatti after his blood and guts performance against Zar Amansat on the Hopkins right undercard. That performance there, he got signed on the spot. His opponent was Cuban lightweight great Yoel Casamayor. I would say Yoel was at the downside of his career. He had two back-to-back -back controversial decisions and he came in with a chip on his shoulder to put on a good show and defeat this in his prime contender. This fight was for the lineal and interim WBO lightweight title. Casamayor started the fight fast, dropping Cassidy's twice beautifully. Yoel will rake up more of a lead, winning rounds two and three. Cassidy's would finally start to crack through Casamayor in the fourth and really just take over the fight. Cassidy's would drop Casamayor in the sixth round. Casamayor was able to survive and make it out of the six. Both guys put it in work and really it could be scored either way. It was three straight swing rounds. And at the beginning of the 10th, Cassidy's blindingly walks into a beautiful counter by Casamayor after seeming to start off the round well. Shortly after being dropped, Casamayor was able to finish him off and retain the lightweight championship, ruining HBO's plans to set up a big fight between Cassidy's and Nate Campbell, who had won the WBO, IBF, and WBA titles off of Juan Diaz earlier that year. Before Glenn Johnson earned his name as one of the greatest journeymen, and Ring Magazine Fighter of the Year, he was an undefeated contender. This was Bernard Hopkins' fifth defense of his IVF crown. Hopkins gave Johnson possibly the worst beating in his career, and it was 11 rounds of punishment. This would be legitimately the first and last time Johnson will be stopped in a fight. Still trying just to stay in this fight. Wingsy a game for a punch, but Hopkins Wide. sticks yeah, up the and that, that over. Russell said yeah. fight's yeah. enough. This was a weird fight. A young 17-year-old Pacquiao was up against, I could say, a gatekeeper, Rustico Torrecampo. Pacquiao had to wear 8-ounce gloves and Torrecampo had to wear 6-ounce gloves because Pacquiao checked in overweight. According to the records here, Pacquiao was knocked out by his shoulder, then the actual punch landing low. So there was absolute no chance of him getting up from that resulting in his first loss. So this is the fight everyone was bugging me to include, and guess what? I'm not allowed to show any footage of this fight. So, sorry family. But I'll do my best to explain the build-up and the fight itself. But not too much, because I'm saving that for another video. Some of y'all may know what that video is. So the first fight between Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury was a draw, and obviously there will be a rematch, all thanks to the hype coming into the first fight, literally thanks to Radio Raheem's interview because if you didn't know the first fight was not selling well till that infamous interview where wilder miscomprehended radio's question and just blew up this interview turned wilder into a certified meme worldwide single-handedly selling the fight then when the actual fight happened and these people who came to watch were not disappointed at all personally i thought that fury did enough to win but as far as having common people outside of boxing, once again talking about not only the sport, but the heavyweight division in America, a part of me was glad. We are finally going to see prize fights, and these guys are finally going to be paid Mayweather and Canelo money. So that's awesome, and the performance the two put up promoting the fight outside the ring, and the actual fight itself, they deserve every bit. Going into the rematch, Water made some huge tactical errors. Him or his team thought it was a great idea to come into the fight much heavier than usual. First fight he came in at 213. The rematch, he was at an astonishing 231. Now heavyweight division when it comes to weight, fighters may come in light, some fights, sometimes heavy, depends if they want to have speed or power. It's all on the opponent they are facing. 
Now with water, that's an awful idea. Reason why it's bad because Fury already had a smidge of the speed advantage in the first fight. Water already has one punch knockout power. Pound for pound, he's putting any man down if he lands. Him putting on extra weight gave up whatever speed he had. Fury, who came in heavier with the intentions of having more power and maybe getting a knockout, he landed quite well in the first fight, but he had a huge lack of power. Fury came in at 256 the first fight and 273 in the rematch. The thing is with Fury, he is used to fighting in between 250 and 275 pounds. He wanted speed against Klitschko, he came in at 247. He wanted some extra pop on his shots and really tire his guy out when he clinches him. He weighed in at 260 against Christian Hammer. The extra weight doesn't affect him. For Wilder though, at the opening bell, you can clearly tell there was something wrong. That extra weight was a mistake. No speed at all. Fury could see the punches coming. He had time to either parry the attack, dodge it completely, or counter. If you look closely, Wilder was already breathing heavy by the second round. The third round, Wilder got hit by a perfect 1-2, landing straight to the temple. His legs were not there. Either he was exhausted already, which I stated earlier, or he was actually hurt. But later that round, Fury was able to score the first knockdown of the fight. After that, it was just downhill from there. Fury was just far fresher. Wilder put up a spirited effort, but it was just a matter of time, and in the seventh round, Wilder's corner threw in the towel. Wilder really protested the stoppage, and Mark Breland really didn't deserve that lashing from him, to where Wilder kicked him out of the locker room. Mark was seen crying outside the locker room. The 2019 year of boxing has been quite tragic. We saw two high profile deaths in the ring in a two day span. Now fighters and boxing fans may not be paying attention to this, but the trainers and ringside officials are. This is no game here. Tensions are high. They don't want to see any more tragedies, especially in the biggest prize fight of the year. Now surprisingly, Tyson wasn't featured in part 1 through 4. Tyson came into the fight 37-0. This was Tyson's 10th defense of the WBC title, 9th defense of the WBA title, 7th defense of the IBF title, and 3rd defense since officially becoming the undisputed champion after defeating lineal champion Michael Spinks. There are two nice documentaries about this fight, 30 for 30, Chasing Tyson, which was more focused on Tyson and Holyfield, and HBO's documentary, The Tale of Tyson Douglas, which covers the entire build-up, fight, and the aftermath. But to briefly explain the build-up, Tyson's preparations for the matchup was awful, and Douglas, who was motivated by the passing of his mother, was having a training camp of a lifetime. And that is literally the mental state of Douglas he had absolute no fear coming in. He didn't care what Tyson was going to do to him. Whatever Tyson brings to him, he would dish it back. He had just lost his mom. In his mind, what is the worst that can happen? In some cases, this could be dangerous. But for Douglas, who was in career peak form, it was going to be a rude awakening for the underprepared Tyson. Douglas that night fought like a top 10 all-time great. There's our right hand again. This one happened every time. seems to be wobbled. Mike is not. Well, there's just no question which is the more confident fighter now. You see how easily. Though Tyson did have a chance to win the fight. Hand uppercut and down goes Douglas. As... Douglas would get back up and shock the world, stopping Tyson in the 10th round. Shades of Ray Leonard against Tommy Hearns. Douglas coming back with a left and right. Hurt. Tyson is wobbling. Tyson needs. will finish things in his oh, the uppercut. What an uppercut by. Don King right after the fight tried having the decision overturned as a Tyson win because of the long count, completely disregarding the referee count rules. And then it starts with the, you know, accusations, well, they might not let you be the champion, you might have to 
relinquished the belt and fight again for the belt. You know, it's like, well, you might have won the fight, but you're not going to enjoy being champion. King thought, since he was outside of America and Japan, that it will easily be overturned. Don King, perhaps because he wasn't in America, was behaving with amazing impunity and bravado. I mean, everybody has seen the facts, and the facts are irrefutable and incontrovertible. Questioning the accuracy of referee Octavio Mehron's count. Little he knew, Japan is possibly the most strict country when it comes to rules and regulation. Now how strict are they? Former champion Daigo Higa was suspended for over a year for coming in overweight on his fight. Kazuto Ioka was almost facing a lifetime ban for having tattoos. These are just recent cases at that, just giving you an idea. Don King had no chance with the JBC, but somehow the WBC and WBA decided to consider the reversal and held a meeting within 10 days to discuss the official decision. This requires no meeting at all. Douglas clearly won. It's things like this is the reason why when Salvatore Gravano, during his huge testimony against the Gambino crime family in the 90s, Joe Watts, who was an associate in our family, told me that he had someone in Las Vegas who could help us get a ranking for Snipes. Watts arranged a meeting for me with Joey Curtis, a boxing referee in Las Vegas. Curtis said he could move Snipe up, Snipes up in the rankings of the World Boxing Council, which is based in Mexico. Curtis said that this would cost 10000 but because it was a favor for John Gotti, he might be able to get it done for about 5000 When it was Senator John McCain's time to talk, his first question was immediately about the mob's association with the WBC. And uh, if you noticed in the past on other occasions, that someone has moved up in the WBC rankings in time for a fight and then that person disappears or drops way down again. Have you seen that happen before? Well, it's common knowledge. I'm not surprised by it. I don't really follow that part of it, but Joey Curtis made me aware of this uh, sanctioning body. I don't really know if any other sanctioning body does it or not. But it was common knowledge that it could be done. Yeah, it's not uh, something that's a major secret. So before this meeting even took place, it met wide scrutiny by the general public. After the huge backlash, both belt organizations decided to recognize Douglas's win and he is the champion. If they didn't, little to their knowledge, many states in America and the British Boxing Commission was already planning on withdrawing from both belt organizations where they will not be recognized as a legitimate world title. Now imagine if that happened. It'll only be the IBF, WBO, and Ring to be the undisputed champion. Final piece of information before I move on. Muhammad Ali was interviewed October 1989 on a BBC talk show how he would fare up against Mike Tyson. Now this is literally just before the Douglas fight. Since one, this is overseas. Two, he's surrounded by his best buds and former rivals. He's going to give his honest opinion and the round he guess he will win is as shocking as the Douglas win itself. What do you think of Mike Tyson? He's powerful and strong. He's a uh, big punch. If he hits you, you're in trouble. Right. How would you have fared against him? Would you have whopped him? Stick, move. Hit sure. him. Yes. Tire him out. Right. After about round 10, move in. Before Inoue, there was Kazuto Ioka, who was on an absolute roll, picking up his first world title in a 7 pro bout at the age of 21. Two fights later, he will unify the division, becoming the WBC and WBA champion at strawweight in his 10th pro bout. He moved up his next fight and became champ in his second weight class. After three defenses, he moved up to his third weight class and faced his amateur rival, 12-0, IBF flyweight champion, Anat Rung Rung. Though there were rivals in the amateurs, Anat always Always had Ioka's number. And in this fight, it was no different. Amnat did fade pretty bad late in the fight where it got real dirty, but he had quite of a comfortable lead. He will win by a questionable split decision. The reason why I say questionable because Amnat clearly won that fight and one judge scored it 114-113 for Yoka. Jude Hilton Whitaker III, if you don't know who this judge is, this person a couple years back was a judge that disgracefully scored the Paul Williams versus Eris Landy Lara fight, scoring it in Williams' favor. Favor. Bob, we're sitting ringside thinking the fight should be stopped because Williams is going to get hurt. He won the decision. Crazy. Crazy. 
This was Duran's third fight in the States and despite his opponent only having one loss out of 33 fights, Duran reportedly did not train for this fight. Keep in mind, Duran had two stay busy non-title fights and a 40 day span that ended in a first round knockout. This fight against Esteban de Jesus was a 10 round non-title bout. So Duran's WBA title was not on the line, was more of an exhibition match to promote himself to US audiences. This was a bad night from the start. Duran is floored in the first round both have terrific records, and there is Duran down, believe it or not. And he is smiling, grimacing. Throughout the fight, he was completely off his game. A rare sight of a weakened Duran with no power on his shots being pushed back by the underdog. Esteban de Jesus will win by a decision. Some may call this a cherry pick gone wrong, but this will spawn a three fight rivalry between the two. Duran will win the second fight by KO, but it was open for a third fight because of the insanely hot temperatures in the arena. 95 degrees plus humidity. It was quoted to feel like a steam bath by Howard Cosell. The third fight, which was four years later, Duran making his 12th defense of the title and De Jesus picked up the WBC title making his 4th defense. This will make their 3rd fight a unification for the undisputed lightweight title. Duran will finally close the book on this rivalry, stopping De Jesus in the 12th round. So in my previous video, I discussed how HBO and K2 Promotions did a fine job of promoting and educating audiences on their new fighter, Roman Gonzalez. The fighters in his weight class and the weight classes around him because more than likely he will be moving up. So fight fans knew who to look up, which unfortunately most didn't bother anyway to do research on Rang Visai. I'm not going to touch that part again. So anyways, for Zhu Ming, the network failed to tell fans who to look out for. So as far as most Western viewers know, Roman Gonzalez, Kasuto Ioka, Juan Francisco Estrada, John Casmero, and McWilliam Arroyo did not exist. They are just B-class guys. Xi Ming, the gold medalist, is going to clean up the division, move up, clean that division out. He got Freddie Roach in his corner. What can go wrong? So when it came to Xi Ming's first world title fight, no one knew a thing about his opponent. So Western fight fans just thought this guy was some random bum with a title. Little fight fans knew because they were so poorly informed that Xi Ming and Anat had a very deep rivalry, and this was the fight to once and for all close the book on that. Due to absolutely grade A piss poor media coverage, Anat was hilariously outed as a 4 to 1 underdog. When I first saw this, I was like, you gotta be kidding me. I literally put a post out stating Xi Ming doesn't have a chance in the world to beat Anat based on what I've seen of both guys at that time. And well, Anat put on a boxing clinic to successfully defend his IBF title, 116-111 on all scores. Cards. <laughs> undefeated versus undefeated contender. This was for Joe Calzaghe's vacant WBC title after he retired from boxing. Keep in mind, Calzaghe was still champ at super middleweight while he was the ring and lineal champ at light heavyweight. Now, Jermaine Taylor was originally supposed to fight Carl Foch in this title grab, but he turned down the fight to fight Jeff Lacey instead. I can only assume that he wanted to tune up against a real super middleweight instead of blindly fighting a highly praised contender where he can potentially lose. Since he turned down the fight, Pascal was next in line. This was just one great battle between two hungry contenders. Twelfth round being one of the best final rounds in super middleweight history. Very reminiscent to De La Hoya Mosley. An absolute classic. Froch will pull through and win the decision to become the WBC super middleweight champion. Froch just winning this last round. Just winning his cell phone. 7,000 people will, learn, will rise in acclamation of this. This has not been the prettiest fight, but it's in its way. This has been a classic. So Butte in his 23rd pro bout in 2008 against Labrado Andrade would have been the first loss, but due to absolute blatant favoritism by the referee, Andrade was robbed of making history of becoming Mexico's first super middleweight title holder. One of the longest counts you'll ever 
mercy. And we run our clock, and Max just takes forever. Well, the hometown ref sees here that Kutay's not going to beat the count. He's on his feet, out on his feet. So he needs to buy time. So he turns around in one of the most contemptible exhibits of hometown refereeing I've ever seen. Maybe the worst I've ever seen. He turns around and tells Andrade to get back to the corner, even though he's already back in the that current title now went to Gilberto Ramirez when he defeated Arthur Abraham in 2016. Butte will later avenge the only unofficial blemish on his resume, defeating Andrade in the rematch. Oh, again! Down again! I think he's hurt badly. I mean, was that a body punch or a head punch? He seems hurt. I can't really find a true documented reason why Butte was not fighting in the Super 6 tournament even though he claimed he wanted to fight the best. But the Super 6 tournament was literally the best of the best of an entire era fighting each other. The favorites to win at the start was Mikel Kessler, Arthur Abraham, or Carl Froch in a very underrated run. Andre Ward will win the entire tournament beating all these great fighters. After missing out on all these big fights and big paydays, once after after the tournament was wrapped up, Butte made his trip to England to make his 10th defense of the IBF title. So despite the competition Froch had to face in the tournament, and the competition Butte had to face, waiting for the tournament to finish, Butte came in the slight favorite to win, almost 2-1 to one betting odds, which more than likely angered Froch because whoa, that man fought very angry from the opening bell. Butte landing here and there, but once Froch landed cleanly on Butte, Froch, such a finisher when he has a guy hurt, didn't have enough time to do his thing as the bell came to an end. This will also happen in the very next round in the fourth. But this time, Butte was unable to recover, and in the fifth round, Froch would crack through Butte again. Now, I don't know the rules in the UK, but I do know this fight very well could have ended in a disqualification, and Butte will be ruled the winner. Massive confusion happens. The ref looked like he stopped the fight when he really was giving Butte a standing eight count. It's very good the ref is fixed focused on Butte because Eddie Hearn jumped in the ring hugging Froch. You can see Froch's trainer flipping out screaming at Hearn to get out of the ring. They can't believe it. Hearn, realizing he made a huge mistake, hurries up and slides back out of the ring. Butte's cornermen, great sportsmen here, come into the ring and have the fight stop, resulting in a Froch TKO. If Butte's corner just decided to let it be, this insanely could have gone the other way. If that ref just once turned around to check if Froch was in the neutral corner, that fight would have been over. Butte winner by disqualification. This was just a good fight. Very even and exciting early on. A real nail biter. Body shot. More confident than he did in their first fight. His power punches. Be really careful of a hit. Good. Hard of another. Just missed for the hook. He lands a hard right hander. The same way he went after this. Bradley with a left hand. Until Bradley is effectively there. Though Manny in the second half will make some great game-changing adjustments, Bradley will make a tactical error fighting Manny's fight when he had done quite well boxing and picking and choosing when to exchange with Manny. He sure did make the fight even more exciting in the second half, but that's a hard task to follow by beating Manny at his own game. By going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, it costed him his O and the title. Trying to pull the Marquez on Pacquiao, have him come in to set him up for the big shot. Oh, that was. Berger is shot there. Oh, that was. Backfired so far this round. It's a big round for Pacquiao. 
Pacquiao will win by unanimous decision. Harold Letterman scored at 116-112 for Pacquiao, and two of the judges had the same score as Harold. Coming into 2002, Shane Mosley was on top of the world. WBC welterweight champion, ranked number one in the world, and number one pound for pound. With such a title of pound for pound number one, the expectations of Mosley were incredibly high with who he was going to face. Because with that title alone, you could pretty much make any worthy matchup happen. Mosley was doing his duties as a WBC champion and fighting whoever he has to face. Which is fine if you're stuck in a bad political situation or not number one pound for pound. The straw that broke the camel's back to push for an opponent to rival Mosley or an easy to promote matchup was the Adrian Stone fight. When the poster to a fight doesn't even have your opponent on it, just his name, that's a huge problem right there. The fight was an absolute mismatch. Despite Stone having a decent record, Stone was brutally put away by Mosley in the third round. This situation had more to do with, with the quality of the WBC rankings at that time. Unfortunately, I can't find those rankings due to poor lack of archival transparency with that organization, which is a huge headache when doing research. On their website, there is no ranking catalog. If you have to go back a certain month and year to find out who was ranked, you will have to rely on some boxing site that may have not posted articles since 2015 that either wrote down those rankings that still have their PDF file from that time to view. Now the rest of the organization sites is all there. You can find the ranks from the IBF month to year all the way from 2021 to 2000. WBA year 2000 WBO year 2000 if some random unranked guy magically moves up into the top five I'm going to see that in their database but anyways Larry Merchant does the most Larry Merchant thing and calls out Mosley of the quality of the opponent I wish I can find the rest of this interview that doesn't have a Russian translator speaking this is all I have and I am one or both of those right here would say okay you beat a C-rated fighter. So what? Well, I mean, you're, you're trying to get wider public acceptance. You fight a guy nobody ever heard of. He's unknown, he's unranked, and you knocked him out. Big deal. But Mosley did state they thought he was a quality opponent because he gave Forrest trouble. And he's in a squabble negotiating a rematch with De La Hoya. So the deal to the De La Hoya fight did not go as planned, and Mosley fought amateur rival Vernon Forrest in a unification match for the Ring Magazine title. This was Mosley's fourth defense of the WBC title. Mosley would start to fight off well. <laughs> tide of the fight would change drastically in the second round. Mosley would receive a hairline cut and just moments later after the fight resumed, Mosley was perfectly set up by Forrest and dropped for the first time in his career. Mosley will get knocked down once again towards the end of the second round to be saved by the bell. Shane seemed like he didn't fully recover after the second round. When it looked like Mosley will have a footing in the round, Forrest will rally back and take it away. Forrest will win by a wide margin on the cards to become the Ring Magazine and WBC Champion. There will be a rematch and Mosley will make it closer, but stylistically Forrest just had his number and would beat Mosley once again to go 3-0 in their rivalry, once in the amateurs and twice in the pros. If you haven't seen the Curb Your Claw Part 4 video, I covered about 90% of the build up to his first loss. So the come up with Saunders, since it will be quite hard for him to get a title shot if he doesn't move to America because a lot was going on from 2012 to 2014. Saunders took the long hard way of getting his shot at the title, picking up the Commonwealth title, very important title, the BBNC title, another important title, WBO international title, and lastly, the European title. After all that, he is now the best contender from Europe. After a big win against Eubank Jr., he got the shot to fight Andy Lee for the WBO middle weight title. Saunders will win by a very close majority decision. After two years of a lot of nothing, trash talk and controversies followed up to being stripped by the WBO, he will later pick up the vacant WBO super middleweight title in 2019. I think that's about the 10% that was not covered in the buildup. So here's my poorly put together pie chart here. The green is people who wanted to see Billy win. The orange is to see him lose. Now extremely hardcore boxing fans, pretty much the equivalent 
equivalent to an indie rock or movie fan may say Prince Patel is the most hated personality in boxing that you never heard of. Everyone's entitled to an opinion. Yeah. I, I think and people I, listen to Prince Patel's opinion. Well, certainly ratings the, don't lie. Certainly, which is a terrific soundbite, and, and 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 I agree. And people have been tweeting all day, and half of the people. Um, are quite unpleasant about you and the other half are even more unpleasant about you but but the bottom line is prince they are talking about you i'll give you that but we can all agree saunders of this era in boxing takes that title so all right the fight itself i mean saunders fought pretty well as expected and also as expected no way he could keep up that pace for long unless he was high on that o i was expecting him to gradually tire out canelo does his thing and takes over the fight maybe a late stoppage this man literally cr crash harder than Enron stock. Canelo, who was already setting up traps earlier in the fight, was easily able to catch him slipping and land one of his biggest shots to the fight in the eighth round, literally breaking his face. 68-66, Canelo, he's only two rounds up. Saunders took an awkward step back and now he's holding on. Judging by Canelo's reaction after the punch and after the round ended, he knew that fight was over, Saunders was forced to retire from the fight or be permanently damaged for life, and Canelo added the WBO title to his collection. And on 